Jackie Hicks. Yeah. Um, so, to answer to your question, well, you risk to be fairly disappointed because you expect uh, you are expecting to hear stories about motor racing and explanation about uh, this and that. Uh, for some of you, you were not born, but uh, uh, I'm going to speak about gardening. <laughs> yes, I do, because in the early days, I never thought I was going to be a, a race driver, as you said. And uh, honestly, my goal was, when I was 16, was to become a gardener or a gamekeeper. So you can imagine how far away we are from motor racing. <laughs> and so, I mean, that's, that was a shocker to me. Um, but, but not really, because you've always had other things that, that occupied your time when you weren't racing. But, but let's talk about that, the thing that got you into racing. So you started out with two wheels. Well... I don't know if, if you have children, so it's probably what I'm going to say. It's not very encouraging, but uh, to start motor racing, you have to be very bad at school. <laughs> and uh, you have to desesperate your parents, so uh, at the end, you are able to ask. You are able to ask them any kind of gift, even if you are the last one. They are so desperate and they're really looking for you to find something interesting. So I didn't find anything better than asking them a motorcycle at the age of 16. And uh, they can't resist to the temptation. But you have to promise that you're going to work better. That's what I never did. <laughs> well, so I did motorcycle. And really, I thought I was going to be... Um, it was a hobby, but definitely not a career. In reality, um, when the story is done, like uh, it is for me, it's much easier to, uh, to judge a number of situations. And today, I'm terribly impressed by the fact that timing or destiny are important. In motor racing, um, if you don't have the right tool, you can't, uh, you can't win. But um, on my part, uh, really at, on that part, a number of people I didn't even know who they were, um, they have some comments or the possibility to give me some directions. And that's how I became um, a racing driver, what I never dreamed about in, uh, before. And I think this is valid for all of us, in a way. To um, reach our goal, we need the, the help of people that you don't even know very well. Um, Who are those people for you? Well, uh, it, can be, it can be a sentence in a book. It can be a, a teacher at school, a, 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 physic or, a physic or a, a chemist teacher. Um, it can be a comment on the radio. Um, it can be uh, somebody like you, for example, that uh, you meet and give you an advice or an information. But um, um, the talent is not sufficient, really. Maybe you're good at something, but you just have to realize you cannot de do it alone. And um, my successes are the result of a number of people you never met, you never see. Um, they prepare a car, in my case, so they are, they, they are motivated, they have a lot of passion. They do what they want um, at 100%. And their only satisfaction, in a way, intellectually, is when you win, is to have done the job. And if you realize you can win without them, I think you, you do a, a big step ahead, in a way. So humility, as a driver, 
because you're. I don't know if it's humility. <laughs> it, it, it's being realistic because the problem of uh, in sport, you have a lot of people who have a huge ego, and that was my case too. And uh, it's not the speed who is really attracting, but um, it's winning or to be one of the best. But as the driver, you're saying you're at the tip of the spear, but the spear is is much larger, and there are a lot of other people involved in that kind of success. So you're the last mile. Is that accurate to say? Well, what I'm trying to say, it's, um, it's very unfortunate in a way uh, that um, when you win, you get all the glory and you, you don't share it the way you should because you have a huge ego and you believe you're the best but you're only the best because you have the right car. And it's easy to win. It's easy to win when you have the right car. It's a way of talking, but frankly, uh, when you have to drive a car, it's not really perfect. It's extremely demanding, and also you have to keep in mind that uh, being in a good team is kind of insurance in a way, and the technical insurance, not having a major problem. And you have to keep in mind that in my era, let's say um, racing was quite dangerous. So one of the members of that team would be a guardian angel. Mm. As, uh, yes, I had a guardian angel who suffered a lot, really. <laughs> um, in the early days, he had white feathers. Uh, at the end, we really, uh, they were really uh, damaged. You really tested. So when he told me that you better think about taking some vacation, I said it was wise, wise to say, uh, yes, I follow your advice. Right. So let's, let's go back to um, y you had, why, why did you switch from motorcycles to touring cars? Well, I didn't choose it. Somebody chose it for me. Uh. Uh, really, um, motorcycle was fascinating. I don't know if you follow a little bit uh, motorcycle Grand Prix. It's a little bit far away from um, car racing, but I don't know if you admire these uh, Marquez or Valentino Rossi. They do incredible uh, job, and at a certain certain moment, I, I thought it's maybe something I can do. But life decided totally differently, and I had on my way people who offered me uh, to drive uh, cars. I took the chance, and um, it never started really as well as you said, in a way, because my first race, I cr crashed the car of somebody else already. So, you know, uh, there, there were already some doubts about my successes in the future, and I thought, one race would be the end of uh, the whole story. But luckily in those days, you were, if you were fast, you could crash a car. You were most of the time forgiven, but you had to be fast, really fast. And um, year after year, it was like school. There were always someone to um, offer me a faster car. And it, each time I was doing well, and each time I was in the right team, so that gave me the chance to, to win the number of races, uh, you said, in different, uh, different era, as you said, saloon car racing or the Canam. Or well, the, when you went to Open Wheel, there's a great story that you, uh, the Grand Prix uh, had Formula One and Formula Two racing at the same time, and uh, you started at the back in a it's a story I can speak about? Or? Sure. Oh, okay. Well, this is a great story, but well, I mean, if you'd like to okay, speak I about it. I didn't know a... where you want to go. I, I mean, thought you were thinking about gardening in my private garden. Well, the gardening garden. And, and the okay. beekeeping, or what was it again? <laughs> Animal husbandry. <laughs> no, but, well, um, in Formula 2, uh, yes, I did a, a very good race. Um, in 67 at the Nürburgring, which is one of the most difficult uh, race, car, uh, race course, definitely. 23 kilometers long, uh, 17 jumps, 
heat slabs, so uh, cars were flying at the time. And um, I did the third fastest uh, of the Grand Prix cars uh, at, at the time. At, but, with much less horsepower, by the way. That's yes, a, much less horsepower, but um, <laughs> there is always a but. <laughs> Nobody knew at the time that I did two times a very specific race at um, the Nürburgring, it's the 86 hour saloon car race. So that means you, you spend roughly four days on the Nürburgring, and when you have done it for four days two times, I can guarantee you, you know where you go at the end. <laughs> yeah. So you, uh, you had an um, unfair advantage, some racers might say? Well, the advantage is a Formula 2, it's much easier to drive than a Formula 1. And when you know where you have to go, you can do really good times. But that was really the real start of my racing life. Um, also, you know, you were great in the Nürburgring. You were probably, of the era, one of the top drivers at the Nürburgring. But you were also great at the rain, or great in the rain. What made you such a good rain driver? Maybe a lack of intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> uh, because somebody reasonable, reasonable don't go flat on the rain, huh? <laughs> it, it's as good an answer as any. But I, I don't believe it's surprising, it. surprising, I know, but that's the reality, <laughs> huh? Um, did it have anything to do... I mean, I'm gonna, this is a leading question because we talked about this before. Did it have anything to do with starting on two wheels and having a, a greater sensitivity to the traction. I think uh, we talked with Mike about it uh, and he says he's good on, uh, he's very good on the rain as well. It's clear. <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> eh? That's it, that's it. <laughs> and we know, uh, we all know that uh, with two wheels, it's harder than four to do uh, mistakes because on motorcycle, you fall immediately. Um, you need a, a lot of sensitivity on the throttle and the, on the brakes. And I'm convinced, um, I'm convinced that in the rain, um, driving motorcycle in enduro and trial and speed helped me a lot. But also it helped me um, later on in the uh, Paris-Dakar race of because you have to read um, the desert is fairly wide, it's rough, you have no information, you, you have to read what goes on, and um, it helped me there as well. Yeah. What was that transition for you like as a, uh, as a young, I mean, because you were, you know, early 20s, um, you had started, you know, four or five years before that, and you, found yourself in the big show uh, by the late 60s. What was your, I mean, as a young driver back then, looking at the guys that were... Well, honestly, um, when you are 23 and uh, you are asked by Enzo Ferrari uh, to join his team, uh, it's quite special. Yeah. But also it's a matter, really, that's once again where the destiny uh, plays a big role. Um, I don't know if, probably you all know Jackie Stewart, for example. In, 60, in 67, before me, Ferrari asked him to, uh, to drive for him. And two things happened were quite good for me. The first one, is uh, he came, he was the very first driver to come with his lawyer. <laughs> and it's normal because he's Scottish and he's well organized on the, that fair. matter. So Ferrari couldn't believe that he had to talk to, a, to the lawyer before <laughs> speaking to uh, Jackie. And um, that's why I say Scottish. It's because um, at a certain point, the commendator Ferrari said to his uh, secretary, what does he want, this Scottish? Um, no, what does he want, this English? 
and the stewards say Scottish, please, <laughs> because <laughs> there is a hell of a difference between a Scottish and an English. And uh, does he want my factory? <laughs> that was the end of the story because I was much cheaper than him. <laughs> so I was engaged. So that you see, yeah, that's and, the way that's the way he started. And Jackie went to Tyrrell, and you uh, battled him that year, and the '68, um, I think, right? In '68, um, yes, I had the privilege to to win a Grand Prix, and I think I don't know, I don't remember. He maybe finished four in the championship, and then. Um, and then, and then, and then. And then. And then you're lucky. You don't crash too often. Uh, you are fast. Uh, you move to the front of the grid. Uh, and then you start to win uh, races counting for the championship, as well as long distance racing. Because what makes a difference between my era and the modern era, you have to know that um, there were no exclusivities in motor racing. Frankly, we were real amateurs. We were ready to drive all sorts of cars. And there were no conflict of interest between Ferrari and Ford. For example, I could do Le Mans in endurance racing and doing the Formula One with Ferrari at the time. And the second reason why um, all the drivers of the era could do saloon car racing, driving a Mustang or a Falcon or a Formula 2 or a GT40 or a 312PB. And it's because there are no sponsors. So um, you're able to build up your successes without limitation. Modern drivers today, they are extremely talented, very talented. I consider it much more difficult than it was in my time, but they can only score one championship at the, at the time. So it's really a hell of a, a, hell of a big limitation. Yeah. <clears throat> Speaking a little bit about Ford and uh, your, uh, uh, your, was this your first time at 24 Hours of Le Mans when you did a kind of a rebellious thing because as I've heard the story, you didn't think the Le Mans start, where people start standing in a line and then run to the cars, uh, that you weren't gonna have any of that. And you walked casually to your Ford GT instead and, uh, and ended up starting at the back of the pack and, and winning. So I, not to give it away, but... I have to tell you, not really casually. <laughs> Because, it was a because I was so slow crossing walking uh, the track that the car were leaving on the other side. <laughs> so I, have to, I had to hurry up at the end. <laughs> but um, yes, sometimes you do strange things. Um, but that in showed incredible presence. No, but it's not, it's not strange. Yes, I killed the start, the Le Mans start forever. That's for... And, I had a lot of enemies after, and a lot of people disliked me really because I really uh, hurt the Le Mans organization and so on. But um, the difficulty, it's, the facility for me that, that year, I was in the middle of uh, the grid, if I can call it the grid. So I knew that with the car I had, I could not win. So it makes a lot of things much easier because you don't have the feeling to lose so much time when you're not going to win. Pressure's off. Uh, yes, probably I would have been uh, on front. I would have uh, run like the others. But the difficulty is to put a seat belt at 320 kilometers per hour down the straight. A six-point seat belt, it's really an exercise to put it on. You know, so really, it was waiting a little bit and, and then go. And the reason why um, nobody put the seat belt on was also at the time because it was the early days of the seat belts. And there were still some people convinced that it was better to be ejected from a, a race car. 
and I can tell you it was definitely not the suggestion. <laughs> That's true. And um... so, Anil, could the way it's said by you, it's a lovely, it's a lovely story. But now, imagine I'm here sitting with all of you, and you say, "Why did you finish second rather than uh, walking at the start?" <laughs> You could have it would much, be a different story. It would have been a totally different story. <laughs> so that's one of the legendary race of uh, Le Mans with the shortest distance between two cars. Right. The, what the, was the distance at the end between you and number, number Under two? 20 meter. The other lesson from that is that you have to trust. Um, if you have to choose, although you have the experience, it's always better to take someone uh, very young and a little bit crazy <laughs> at the wheel because my opponent was a fantastic driver, a German driver called uh, Hans Hermann, Formula One driver as well, age 38, but of course much more reasonable than me. So for him, it was really a, a disadvantage because he would have break at 100 meter, I would have break at 95. So um, <laughs> you have to believe in young people and I, I think the world belongs, especially in sport, to uh, young kids and you can see it in, in Formula One uh, today or in car racing today. There are a lot of kids who are 17, 18, 19 and um, they do perform as r real great champions. So uh, I think the world is well made in, in a way. Yeah. Um, let's go up, up into the Porsche years a bit because that's when I sort of started watching you and, and uh, realized that I'm, I just, I love those cars. That was such a great era for Me too, I love cars. these cars. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I fall in love many times. <laughs> with these cars. Well, so you started with the, uh, the 936, the fir first turbo uh, prototype, of, uh, right? Um, great success with that car. What was that, I, I, not to get too nerdy, but what was that car like to drive? Because it looks insane and it wasn't quite as well developed as the cars that would come after it. Well, modern, modern racing, uh in 1970 or in 2020, uh, it's always the same. You get the best of the technique at, um, at the time. Um, the new thing was um, the turbocharge, definitely. Uh, that car was doing, uh, I think, 360 kilometer per hour at uh, Le Mans. It's an alu aluminum frame, so it's a very light version. It's better not to kiss the uh, the guardrail, otherwise you are in big trouble. But um, a Porsche, it's an exceptional car. And to drive 10 years, 10 years with the Porsche team, as I said, it's an, not only an insurance, but it's a guarantee to have a, a winning car. So they helped me to win um, with Porsche 25 long distance races and probably 40 podium and if I had my experience with Ferrari in prototype and, uh, and Ford, um, all these unknown people that made me what I am, that means um, winning I think 48 long distance races counting for the championship and uh, 80 podium, oh, it's really a lot, a lot when you when you compare, um, you compare it with normal racing and including the, the mileage you do in Formula One. And um, my chance really is to have done a huge number of kilometers at high speed without being hurt. And this is not a matter of talent, it's um, only a matter of uh, luck. But those years, five years with Ferrari, uh, three years with Ford, uh, 10 years uh, with the Porsche, and all the Can-Am with... Yeah. You know, 
you have always memories on uh, people you have met, who are probably unknown to you, but um, if you take the name Ken Tyrrell, I don't know if it means something for you, but uh, a great coach, uh, a very encouraging person. Uh, um, when you drive for him, you feel uh, loved and appreciated. Um, it was a team effort with his wife. Uh, also, they were doing, we were uh, welcome at home when I was 18, 19. And um, he's really the key of my success in Formula One. And I can relate that, for example, uh, with Carl Haas in uh, Canam Seri. Him and Bernie, who, at the time, there was Paul Newman also in involved in it and when we won I had exactly the same feeling and for people like Peter War or David York with the Porsche GT, the, the Ford GT40 um, I count on the human the human aspect really uh, it's fantastic to be sur surrounded uh, by people we love or, or love you and I'm sure you know you know that feeling well and when you feel loved, the, the results are totally different. Um, I, I told you we were going to get philosophical because uh, looking back, I mean, I, I could, I, I know we're going to go to get to questions uh, in the uh, audience questions in a few minutes, but I want to kind of, looking back now, I mean, you, we, were, we were talking a little bit about that kind of thing. What, what, are there any other things that, you think about when you look back at your career that, that you, at the time, um, maybe didn't see or maybe were too deep in the fight to, uh, to notice? Well, it's always easy uh, to judge uh, a life when you are reaching uh, the end of it, in a way, because the story is already written and uh, you, ca you can find out where you are right, where you are wrong, but more than that, you can appreciate what the others have done for you. And in my case, really, I'm the result in performances of those people, unknown people, who did everything they liked in a way, but always in, uh, always in the shade. And... Um, of course, also at the end, you are able to see there I was right or there I was uh, wrong, and you accept much more easily uh, of being guilty of certain uh, mistake. Um, also, the lesson is um, in those days, a, year, uh, a driver or two die every uh, season. So you were not leaving home the Friday without being sure to be back the next Monday. But it never stopped me uh, trying to be, uh, of trying one of the best. But it was risky and I say that because the way you present all this, um, it looks marvelous in a way. The story looks nice, but also you learn a lot from the sadness of your mistake, or you learn a lot of the people you have loved or, or disappear in a dreadful accident. So, and also at the, at the same time, you are marked forever from those things and uh, you have them in the memory. And I think uh, it helped you to, to become a little bit better. Well said. Um, do you want to go and go to the audience and ask uh, if you guys have any questions? Um, where's uh, Dorian is going to bring around a microphone? There you go. Do you think there was a difference between uh, Ferrari and Porsche when it came to driver safety? There was this uh, recent movie about um, how Ferrari killed so many drivers. And was, was Porsche any better? No, I wouldn't say that uh, at all. Uh, the privilege is to drive for um, a works team. 
And when you drive for a works team, every single part of the car is replaced in due time. Um, but that gives me the opportunity to speak about Enzo Ferrari. Um, you hear all sorts of comments on that extraordinary, extraordinary story of, uh, and the legend of Ferrari, which one of the uh, big names still today uh, with Coca-Cola, Ferrari, and uh, maybe McDonald. Everybody knows what a Ferrari is. Um, you can hear a lot of comments on Ferrari, um, Enzo Ferrari, and some critics time to time. But as far as I'm concerned, I always felt really very well treated. I was not on, always perfect, definitely, but he was extremely patient. I always felt that he treated me like um, a son, in a way really, with a lot of tenderness, and that was very important to me at the time. The difficulty for him was to be close to his driver simply because he lived the pre-war uh, racing, or was even more dangerous than the one of the 50s, and he never wanted to be too close to people who were driving for him because he knew, he knew that the worst may happen in those days. So we didn't want to suffer to be of the proximity of to be too close from, uh, from his uh, driver. And um, by Porsche, it's the same group, it's a different way. Uh, the romantic way of Ferrari isn't there. It's, it's strict, it's efficient, uh, um, and they do very well, really. They both le are legend, and amazingly, they started their uh, factory uh, a year apart. They both had uh, almost 70 years anniversary, anniversary by one year apart. Thank you. Jackie, can you talk about cars that maybe you looked forward to driving with great anticipation and the car's performance maybe disappointed you or didn't live up to what you thought it might be versus a car that you thought, well, I don't really expect a lot out of this, but it turned out to be magnificent. Well, you never, you never hear drivers complaining about their winning cars. <laughs> uh, and definitely uh, their bad memories is uh, when you are um, driving, you made the wrong choice, you have to drive a, a car which is fairly old and um, fairly fragile and then you lose your confidence. And um, I could have an, an happy time with Team Lotus, for example, but uh, sadly um, I had a lot of mechanical failure, not engine failure, a chassis failure and um, uh, that gave me a hard time and um, in a way that the moment you start to ask yourself questions and about your luck and so on, so um, uh, I was starting to go downhill at that time, and, uh, you, but you always hope to recover and having the right timing with somebody else, but uh, if you are re realistic and wise, Rather than being last on the grid, it's much easier to, to leave before you are thrown out. And that's the reason why I've joined all the type of categories where I was motivated and uh, I had the joy of winning again. And then uh, after Porsche, I did the fam famous off-road racing Paris-Dakar 12th time. I had the chance to win it too with great cars. and. Uh, I don't know if you know the desert or if you know Africa, but uh, um, the desert is something fascinating. You race in it, but beside that you meet the people who live differently uh, in that desert or in this country where uh, um, there is not much um, happiness on certain times. And it puts you at exactly at the rival um, you know your right value in a way. You feel definitely very small and uh, 
you have to come back on earth and uh, you realize you realize how fragile humans are you realize how short life is and uh, how wonderful it is and um, how did you prepare it's nice to get old but there is a french author who said it's nice to get old but uh, it's very unfortunate that it finished so badly <laughs> How did you prepare for uh, the car? I mean, because had you spent much time in the desert? I mean, were you, uh, had you driven, you know, in the area? When you got out there for the first time, were you ready? Did something happen? No, I was not ready. <laughs> it was a hell of a surprise. Right. You, I felt on, a, on a, another planet, really. I had to relearn uh, everything. And yet you still had to race it, right? So how, how long in, in the race did it take before you were at least sort of comfortable? Or were you never Well, you have to know that the Paris-Dakar, it's uh, the, where races of 12, between 12,000 and 40,000 um, kilometers on three weeks with stages of completely off-road of uh, 600 to 700 kilometers. So you feel the emptiness of the era and uh, uh, you realize that you're really uh, somewhere else. But it took me, you never learned completely, but it took me two or three years to understand how it works. Mm. Because when you're stuck in the sand and you spend, you spend 45 minutes trying digging your car out of, uh, you try not to do it two times the same day. <laughs> Jackie, I think from memory you drove like a GT40, a 512, and a 956 or something in Le Mans. I mean, these are ones that stick out in my mind, I think. What, can you give us some color around what it was like to maybe what stands out in your mind from each of those cars? I know they're different eras, but what, you know, what. what What's memorable about each of those eras and, and, and the cars and the driving? All the cars look alike. Uh, and to set them uh, in terms of towing, camber, uh, springs or roll bar, it's very, very simple. It's not, it was so simple compared to today's uh, motor racing. But the goal... Uh, Often you have asked me if the, the speed attracting, yeah. the speed is, is not the key of uh, the, the desire of, it's not the, 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 the speed who is attractive. What is attractive is to be one of the best and it's probably most of the time to beat all the others and being the best. Uh, the difference probably are in the ego of uh, the drivers. Uh, some want to win more than uh, some to win more than others. But um, it's interesting to defend the colors of Ferrari, for example, and then you feel the duty uh, to do well and uh, the goal. And then sometimes in life you go in the opposite camp and uh, you drive for a Porsche and then you cause to your ex-partner some difficulties and uh, on that I must admit that uh, before I joined, Paul, uh, I, I joined Porsche uh, I distur disturbed them a lot with the Ferrari or the GT40 or the Ford Mirage <laughs> yes you gave them trouble. Yes, I <laughs> did. But I did give trouble to a number of people. Huh? <laughs> um, so, Jackie, perhaps a question um, looking forward. So, if you look back at perhaps your history, perhaps what I grew up with, racing was very much man and machine, and perhaps more man than machine. The future now seems to be more about the machine and less about the driver, man or woman, be that as it may. Do you see a bright future, or do you see that perhaps the golden days are sort of behind us here for racing? Yes, um, in depend, depending in which category you are. If you do uh, Formula One, for example, in those days, um, 
Yes, they were, uh, the drivers were the key of a number of things. And even driving not the fastest car, you were able, uh, you were able uh, to win. In long distance, in that uh, era, uh, drivers were not the most important. The real goal was to be able to finish with the car because they were unable at the time to say the gearbox with last or the engine with last because it's not the same formula as it is today. If you go to Le Mans today, it's a Grand Prix race. You know if you drive a Porsche or, or a, an Audi or a Toyota, you have all the chances to, to finish the race and uh, if you're lucky and you have to stop a little bit less than the others, uh, you can win it. And these last three uh, Le Mans races were really fascinating because the differences um, between the car were very small and also at the end it was always plenty of surprises because for example the Toyota was supposed to win they stopped in the last lap and the Porsche won so the differences are very 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 small and very demanding for, for the drivers but they will be always the question your question also um, your question, it's a way to see motor racing in the future. Uh, they use simulator today to train, to practice and, uh, and all that. And also the mobility is, is changing in the future. The question is maybe, uh, is there going to be racing in 20 years time from now? Um, are we going to have electric uh, vehicles to race with? As we, they are doing it already now with the Formula E. That's, in my opinion, totally unpredictable, but it's crystal clear that life on the planet will be different in a reasonably short time, and we have no other choice than changing our habits. You've uh, had opportunities to compete with Andretti's, Fittipaldi's, Stewart's, who have you enjoyed competing with? I didn't, uh, and then post-race, who have you enjoyed the, competing with oh. or hanging out with? So you didn't hear the question, but uh, you've raced with some of the greats of all time. Fittipaldi, uh, Jackie Stewart. Um, uh, I, I didn't hear whoever, whoever else you said, but, but of, the, of that ilk, who, if I'm getting this question right, who uh, did anyone stand out as a, a form the most formidable competitor, or or someone that you remember, you know, just in competition with? That was, I mean, we could talk about Jackie because that's specific. well. It's, it honestly, it's a difficult answer because um, when you reach Formula One, you have the best driver in the world. Uh, the challenge is to beat them. Um, but at the time, we all lived together. We were sharing the same uh, hotels. We were knowing each other very well. We knew uh, racing uh, was dangerous. Um, you mentioned uh, a number of names, but uh, clearly, for example, there was Jochen Rint who won the uh, 1970 uh, championship. Um, and he died at the Italian Grand Prix. Um, he was the leader, he has all the points to be a champion. And the question was, do, can, we, can we have a, a, a champion with a, tile, a, a posthum uh, title? And for me, I could have maybe won that year, but anyhow, I have one or two points less. Uh, I was happy that um, he was the champion because if I would have been, they would, uh, even with more points, they would have always said, well, it's because uh, he disappeared and uh, he deserved what he, he really deserved what he, uh, that championship. But uh, people like Jim Clark or, or Sterling Moss or Fanjo, uh, at a time where there were really uh, there were really no money and real amateurs, 
um, they are the greatest, but there are so many talented drivers who disappear. I can mention Ayrton Senna for sure. Yeah. And uh, or Michael Schumacher, who had uh, this incredible uh, ski accident. He lived 20 years full speed, and uh, he had a, a, an accident at uh, 10 kilometers per hour. So that's why I say uh, there, are, there is a lot of happiness, but for also a lot of sadness, definitely. Well? Well, Jackie, thank you so much. No, uh, I thank you. I thank you. And thanks to Classic Car Club Manhattan. Thank you very much. Thank you.